Okay, welcome. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the STI Expert Hour webinar, Mycoplasma Genitalium. What's new? My name is Dr. Kelly Johnson. I am the Medical Director of the California Prevention Training Center, and I'll be emceeing today's webinar and going over some of the introductory slides. I'm going to go off camera while I do that just to save us some bandwidth. So first, a little bit more about the California Prevention Training Center. The California PTC, or CAPTC, is a multidisciplinary training and capacity building assistance center. STI clinical training is sponsored by the CDC, and we're a member of the National Network of STD Clinical Prevention Training Centers, or NNPTC. Through our STI clinical training, we provide virtual and in-person training events, technical assistance, clinical tools, and STI clinical consultation services focusing on complex STI issues in patient care. You can learn more about STI clinical training at CAPTC and the NNPTC by visiting the web pages listed on this slide. The CAPTC also runs the STD clinical consultation network for our region. This is an online clinical consultation network where providers can submit complex STI questions and a subject matter expert will reply either by phone or email per your preference within one to five business days. Here is our financial disclosure. We have nothing to disclose. And here's our CME disclosure stating that today's webinar is offered at 1.25 units. Here are the CME requirements to earn those 1.25 units. So you must have registered for the webinar on the NNPTC website by the deadline. Please note that registration is now closed. If you're registered for this webinar, but you're not logged into Zoom using your own name, please type your name into the Q&A box. You'll need to stick with us for the full webinar today by watching it live and again in full. Unfortunately, we can't give CME credit to those viewing the recording of this webinar, nor can we give partial credit for viewing just a portion of the webinar. Attendance will be noted as you sign on to the webinar. You will also need to complete the post-course survey evaluation by a deadline of January 26th of this year. Those registered on NNPTC for the webinar will receive an email notification from training at nnptc.org with the link to the post-course survey evaluation within 24 hours following the end of today's webinar. The notification is sent to the email address you use to register on the NNPTC site. To ensure you receive the notification, you can add training at nnptc.org to your safe and trusted senders list. Please also check your spam and junk folders if you don't see this email in your main inbox. CAPTC's CME provider is the University of Nevada Reno School of Medicine or UNR. If you meet CME requirements, you'll receive notification from CAPTC at UCSF.edu within four to six weeks from the post-course survey evaluation deadline, and this email will have the link to claim your certificate from UNR. The email notification is sent to the email address you use to register for this webinar again on the NNPTC site. So to ensure you receive the notification, please also add CAPTC at UTSF.edu to your safe and trusted senders list. And again, be sure to check your spam and junk folders if you don't see the notification in your inbox. A couple of quick housekeeping notes about Zoom. Microphone, video, and chat will be turned off for attendees, but the Q&A will be turned on. Presenters will have access to microphone and video. To use the Q&A, click on the Q&A icon as seen here on the slide. This will be located on the bottom of your Zoom screen. Once you click on the Q&A icon, you can type in your question and click send to submit. If you want to send anonymously, then you can select anonymous. You can submit questions up until the last two minutes of the Q&A section. Also during the webinar, I'll be reviewing the Q&A and may answer your questions directly, or they may be answered live during the Q&A session. You can also submit any administrative questions into the Q&A as well, and they'll be answered by our clinical administrative team consisting of Elizabeth Olson and Lauren Blakely. If you have any questions, you can reach out to Elizabeth Olson, who is our CAPTC clinical program manager. Her email address is shown on the slide, elizabeth.olson at ucsf.edu. 
And now without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today's webinar, Dr. Lindley Barbie, who we're very fortunate to have. Dr. Barbie is an infectious disease physician with clinical research and public health expertise in sexually transmitted infections. She has a particular interest in antimicrobial resistant bacterial STIs, specifically gonorrhea and mycoplasma genitalia. Dr. Barbie recently joined the CDC as the Division of STD Prevention's clinical team lead. And that's it for me. I'll turn it over to you now, Dr. Barbie. Thank you again so much for being here. Thank you, Kelly. And thank you to all of you who joined us today. Give me just a second to share my slides. Is everyone seeing those? Yes, looks good. Okay, thanks. And then I am also going to go off camera for bandwidth issues um, during the presentation and we'll come back on during the Q&A session. So today we're talking about mycoplasma genitalium and what is new. I do have a couple of disclosures. First of all, I recently transitioned from the University of Washington to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And while at the UW, I did receive um, uh, research support from industry partners. Um, and this talk is really uh, my own scientific um, uh, views and not those of the CDC. I also would like to acknowledge um, one of my um, colleagues at the University of Washington, Dr. Lisa Manhart, who has shared many of her slides with me. And there are three things that I want you to take away from um, this lecture today. The first is if you can describe the clinical syndromes that are associated with mycoplasma genitalium, recognize the current trends in mycoplasma genitalium and microbial resistance, and then how to manage difficult treatment cases of um, resistant MGen. So what is mycoplasma genitalium? It is a bacteria. It's a bacteria called a molecule. That means it is a bacteria that actually lacks a cell wall. And interestingly, it has one of the second smallest known genomes of a bacteria, um, which is about less than 500 genes. Even though it is this small, the lack of a cell wall really makes it difficult to culture. So there's only about three or four laboratories in the entire world that are able to do this. And it is very slow to grow and it takes about six months time. So culture is not really an effective me method for diagnostic purposes. Um, we are diagnosing these days with NATS nucleic acid amplification test or detection of part of the genome. So what does mycoplasma genitalium do? Well, um, we're all here to learn about STIs and it really is associated with a couple of different of the reproductive health disease syndromes. So on the left, we're looking at a meta-analysis conducted with the association of mycoplasma genitalium with male urethritis. Um, and you can see here, um, there's a ton of studies and they all very consistently show a positive association um, with MGen. So the, the meta-analysis odds ratio is an association of 5.5 with a fairly narrow confidence interval there. So we have consistency of the evidence and strength of the evidence to really confirm that MGen is a causative pathogen of male urethritis. On the right-hand side, we're looking at the female syndromes, cervicitis, PID, preterm birth, spontaneous abortion, and infertility. And um, I will say the female data has been a little bit more inconsistent, although in, in this analysis, we do have an overall odds ratio of around two. You can see that um, infertility has not been shown to be statistically significantly associated with mycoplasma genitalium. Cervicitis and pelvic inflammatory disease are much more closely associated. Um, to talk a little bit more about the pelvic inflammatory disease, we can look at you know, epidemiologically the consistency of the evidence and the strength of the evidence. We also need some biologic plausibility. And here we're looking at scanning electron micros, uh, microscopy of the fallopian tube um, on the left-hand side under normal control, healthy fallopian tube images. And you can see the beautiful cilia that are there um, that help the egg transport from the ovary into the uterus for um, um, fertilization and implantation. Now, the um, 
kind of the classic PID um, pathogen would be chlamydia trachomatis. And you can see the images there where all of those beautiful cilia have been killed or destroyed in some way. And you can understand the process by which the bacteria can change the fallopian tube and cause infertility. And then if you look at the panel on the right, infection with mycoplasma genitalium, you can see that it's kind of somewhere in between the two. So it's not as severe as that with chlamydia trachomatis, um, but it's certainly not the healthy tissue. And so there is some biologic plausibility there, but it also may explain a little bit why the strength of the evidence isn't as strong as with chlamydia trachomatis. What are some of the other um, clinical syndromes that um, MGen um, has been associated with? Well, we know that it's detected in the rectum fairly frequently, but it is unclear if it actually causes proctitis. There, it has been detected in cases of proctitis, but the strength of the association is not as strong. We do know there's been some interesting developments in the data recently about interaction or potential synergy with bacterial vaginosis. Um, so in, um, in a study among um, women with BV, um, those with BV were three and a half times more likely to acquire MGen. Um, and the, this, the first two lines there under the BV were both cohort studies. Um, so the second one was a cohort study where they only enrolled women who had asymptomatic BV and followed them over, the, over time. And among those with BV, there was really high incidence and a persistence of M genitalium for a longer period of time. And the third um, newer and interesting study that came out was a randomized clinical trial by um, Harold Weisenfeld and colleagues where they added metronidazole to kind of a standard PID regimen of ceftriaxone plus doxycycline. So, you know, one arm, it was about 116 individuals got the standard ceftriaxone plus doxycycline. And in the other arm, um, they got ceftriaxone, doxycycline, and metronidazole. And all the, although the primary endpoint of, of reduced symptomatology at three days was not reduced, was not um, statistically significantly different. If you looked out at 30 days, there was a statistically significant difference in the persistence of mycoplasma genitalium, which was, which was quite an interesting finding and suggests that there may be some sort of interaction between BV or the environment um, that BV creates and the acquisition or persistence with um, mycoplasma genitalium. And then lastly, there have been associations, as most of our bacterial STIs have shown, of an increased risk of HIV infection. So I want to move on a little bit to epidemiology, and I think this is a, a um, really unique surveillance study that Dr. Manhart is leading um, with colleagues across um, the U.S. Um, it's called the My Genius, which is also just a really fabulous name for an MGen surveillance study in the U.S. Um, but all of the participating clinics that you see here with the red stars um, are submitting two cycles of about 200 or 400 um, remnant specimens from each, um, twice a year. So over about a two month period, twice a year, they're collecting 100 male asymptomatic urines, 100 male symptomatic urines, um, and the same for um, female bodied individuals as well. Um, to get at what is the prevalence of MGen in an STI clinic population, both in the asymptomatic and the symptomatic um, states. And you can see here that it ranges somewhere from about 10 to 24%, which is um, it's fairly high for, for an STI. So to dig down a little bit more into some of that data, um, when they looked at the um, uh, uh, gender and sexual orientation um, for men who have sex with women, the prevalence, um, and this is overall both asymptomatic and symptomatic, was about 19%. For men who have sex with men, it was 11%. Women who have sex with men, 19%. Women who have sex with women, 12%. And unknown gender or, sex per, uh, or sexual orientation um, was about 17%. And then if um, you look at this kind of by age and symptom status, um, you can see as expected in symptomatic patients, 
the proportion um, is slightly higher, particularly in um, ma males um, urine specimens. So about 30, you know, somewhere from 12 to 30%, depending on the age. This 33% in asymptomatic under 18 is probably a very small denominator, I would think. Um, and then for the female urine specimens, um, they're a little bit more on par, um, although you know it kind of depends on your age. So, but regardless, particularly at the younger ages, these are very high um, positivity rates um, for these um, urine or vaginal specimens. Now, um, this group also looked at it based on the clinical diagnosis from the, the clinic date that that remnant specimen was from. Um, and among individuals who were diagnosed with PID at that date, 15% um, also had MGen, and, they, and this does not um, differentiate. They may have been co-infected with something else as well. Um, of those with cervicitis, about 12% um, had MGen, and those with vaginitis, about 20%. At MGEM and for urethritis is about 26%, which is about what we think the contribution of MGEM to male urethritis um, in the US is around 15 to 25%. So those are STD clinic patients. What about in the general population? Um, so here, these are more um, population-based surveillance samples of, of remnant specimens. Um, and in the general population, the prevalence is about 1% um, in the US um, and most of Europe, and then slightly higher um, among female swabs or vaginal swabs um, in London and Australia. But if you put this in context with um, chlamydia that has a population prevalence of about 4% and gonorrhea that has a population prevalence of about 5%, it really does fall somewhere in the middle of those. So what about our extra genital sites at the throat and the rectum? Um, so this is new data from a cohort study that I completed at the University of Washington where we enrolled 140 men who have sex with men who were at risk of an STI, um, and we asked them to swab their throats and their rectums each week for a period of a year. And this study was really designed to look at the incidence and duration of gonorrhea and chlamydia, um, but we did add on um, MGen testing um, in later, um, uh, later analyses. And so, um, among those on their first week of testing, there were four pharyngeal infections and 10 rectal infections among the about 108 who returned the first week swabs for a prevalence of about 4% at the pharynx and 9% at the rectum. And then excluding those individuals um, who were prevalent at baseline, looking at those who developed infection during the study period, another 14 individuals developed a pharyngeal infection and 15 developed a rectal infection for an incidence of somewhere between you know, 17 to 20 per 100 person years. So definitely not insignificant. And how long do these infections last? Um, so we follow them and you know, at the time that this study was conducted in 2016 to 2018, MGen testing was not routine um, in our clinic or really in any clinic um, in the U.S. at that time. Um, and, and none of these individuals, I'll say, received moxifloxacin. They may have received doxycycline or azithromycin. Um, but following them out over time and then conducting Kaplan-Meier survival estimates um, to account for those who did receive a, a potentially MGen active drug or were lost to follow up um, for rectal infections, we found that the median lasted 41.7 weeks. So these can last for a very long time. And that for pharyngeal infections, the median was about 12 weeks. Um, so although there has been a perception that pharyngeal infections are one, infrequent, and two, short duration, I think that uh, that might need to be reconsidered. Okay, so that was the conclusion of um, our clinical and epi, and I'd like to move on to talk about one of the most, what I think is one of the most intriguing aspects of this bacteria, um, and that's its antimicrobial resistance. 
Um, and the CDC has put out an antimicrobial resistant threat list, uh, both in 2013 and 2019. And in 2019, they added a watch list. Um, and mycoplasma genitalium became one of three organisms on that watch list. And I think, um, I think that's incredibly um, appropriate, and I'm going to explain why over the next few slides. But most importantly, it has a really high mutation rate. Um, it's, you know, and it mutates very quickly in the presence of antibiotics. Um, and I think that probably has to do both with its slow growth and its small genome. Um, we know that with azithromycin, a you know, just a single gram dose of azithromycin in the presence of MGen and about 10 to 12% of those organisms are going to um, develop resistance. And if we look at this over time, um, looking back towards the time period before 2010, when resistance was really pretty low, like under 5%, over about a seven to 10 year time period, Macrolide or azithromycin resistance increased to over 50%. If you're looking here in the overall time period, uh, overall time period, and then otherwise these other graphs are by region. And then in Americas, that is very consistent, less than 5% before 2013 to you know almost over 60% in the 2016 to 2017 um, era. You also think about what was happening in the STI world at the same time was that we started to recommend um, you know, azithromycin more often, both for chlamydia treatment, but also as co-treatment with um, gonorrhea. So kind of looking at MGen macrolide resistance mutations um, regionally across the US in a more cross-sectional way, we can see that the prevalence at this point is, is fairly high, 44 to 90% um, of the clinics that have reported on macrolide resistance um, in MGen, um, you know, have it, which makes azithromycin a pretty unattractive choice for, for treatment. So if we look at the efficacy, right, the, does the resistance marker match with the efficacy, um, we can see a change as well. So um, I'm because we've been talking about azithromycin, I'm going to start with the center panel here, which is the azithromycin one gram dose. Before 20, 2009, um, it was pretty effective, nearly 90% effective. But as those macrolide resistance mutations were increasing, um, the uh, the efficacy has decreased to under 70%. And I would say it's, you know, you know, the last study on here was really from uh, 2013. It has gotten a lot lower um, since then. Now, if you move to the left-hand side, let's talk about doxycycline. So doxycycline um, in vitro or in the lab looks like it should be effective, but in clinical um, use is only about 30 to 45% effective across the board. Um, and it's it's really curious why that is, but it's pretty consistent that doxy is only 30 to 45% effective. And that's um, from three different studies you can see there from um, MENA, Schwebke, and um, Manhart. You can also see the timeline of um, the azithromycin uh, efficacy declining over the, the you know, four-year study period there. Now on the right-hand side, the third drug that we have available really to treat mycoplasma genitalium is moxifloxacin. Um, and there have been a number of studies looking at the efficacy of moxifloxacin um, against the uh, mycoplasma genitalium. And again, if we look at this in a time way, Prior to 2010, it was 100% effective, which is great, um, at both the seven and the 10 day dose. But after 2010, as azithromycin resistance was increasing and efficacy decreasing, and people started using moxifloxacin as their treatment, we've started to see some declines. So where are we with the fluoroquinolone resistance mutations? Um, this is kind of a cross-sectional look um, by region. Um, but somewhere from 3 to 15% 
as of about 2017. And I will say in the US, we're really above 11% in the US for the fluoroquinolone resistance mutations that we know confer resistance to moxifloxacin. So what are we going to do about all that and how can we manage um, M genitalium for our patients? Well, first of all, we have to be able to detect it and we detect that with diagnostic tests. And as I said, culture is not, um, it does not work reliably, at least for, um, for clinical purposes. Um, and so we use nucleic acid amplification tests, which um, detect part of the genome. There are two available in the US um, that are FDA approved, and that is the um, Hologic Aptima MG and the Roche Cobas um, TV MG. So that's a dual platform for Trichomonas and Mycoplasma genitalium. And they have very comparable um, performance profiles. Um, the third um, a uh, diagnostic test that is on the gray and black chart here is the Resistance Plus by Speedex. And that is listed because it has a unique property in that it can detect macrolide resistance as well. Now, this is not FDA approved, but it is approved in Australia, Europe, the UK, um, and I'm missing one other country there, but I think in Canada as well. Now, and if you have the resistance detection at the same time as the clinical detection, it allows you to triage your treatment decisions in something called resistance-guided therapy. In the purple box to the right, I'm showing a few more that are available outside of the United States. Now, the other thing to be aware of is that some of the commercial laboratories have developed laboratory developed tests or kind of what we call homebrew test. I want to warn you that these are typically less sensitive than the FDA approved test. And I'm going to um, share our experience um, in the Seattle King County STD clinic when we brought <clears throat> Aptima testing online um, in 2019. So as part of our laboratory's validation process, they sent specimens to a commercial laboratory, which was using its own in-house PCR. And as you can see here, the Aptima um, developed test um, detected six positive um, cases of MGen, whereas the commercial laboratory only detected two. And if we use the optimal Aptima as the referent, and I will tell you that during this time period, the only specimens we sent were of symptomatic patients. So I believe the, the Aptima test results. Um, the, the commercial laboratory had nearly a 70% false negative rate and was only 33% sensitive. Um, and we were not the first ones to find this. Um, the French um, published a study in the Journal of Clinical Microbiology um, prior to, to our findings here and found um, of a different laboratory, I'm not even sure which laboratory, but a different in-house PCR of a sensitivity of only about you know, 59, 60%. So just be careful. And it, it's really important that you know which test um, your laboratory is using. Okay. So um, we talked about which diagnostic tests are available, but when do we use them? And so I'm going to delve a little bit into the 2021 CDC testing guidelines for MGen. But before I do that, I want to review kind of testing strategies um, and why we do it. So screening tests are recommended as kind of a primary prevention method to detect a disease that we know can cause problems in the long term, and we have an intervention that will prevent those sequelae, right? So we can prevent transmission, we can prevent individual level sequelae, um, and we have an intervention for it. Diagnostic tests are used for people with symptoms to help alleviate those symptoms by directing treatment against the organism um, that is causing their symptoms. A test of cure is used for someone who has been diagnosed with a particular infection to ensure that they have cleared or eradicated that pathogen. Um, so 
in the 2021 CDC testing guidelines for MGen, um, there is no recommendation to screen asymptomatic um, persons. And the, the rationale for this is that we really don't have enough data on what, <clears throat> what MGen does for long-term sequelae. In asymptomatic infection, does it confer PID? We don't really know that. Can it lead to epididymitis or other unwanted um, problems? We don't really know. And especially given what our situation is with antibiotics, we really need to um, be mindful of the use of antibiotics, particularly um, in the setting of mycoplasma genitalium. Diagnostic testing is recommended only in cases of persistent or recurrent urethritis. Um, this is probably one of the most controversial things that came out of the 2021 CDC guidelines. And most people are saying, why doesn't the CDC recommend testing at the initial NGU presentation? And I think there's a number of reasons for this, but I think that some of the strongest rationale is that there is evidence that some of these cases will spontaneously clear or with doxycycline alone. So 30 to 45% are going to clear with the doxycycline and maybe we can avoid using the moxifloxacin. And this will preserve it um, and prevent the development of moxifloxacin resistance. Um, test of cure is recommended only when a non-moxifloxacin um, uh, non -moxifloxacin re regimen is being used. This would be in the case of someone who can't take moxifloxacin for an allergy or some other intolerance, and they end up getting doxycycline with high dose azithromycin. Um, Again, coming back to we don't know the natural history enough of MGen to say what will happen from asymptomatic infections and this need to balance antimicrobial stewardship. But there is new data coming out, and I wanted to share something from your esteemed Dr. Kelly Johnson, who um, introduced our session today, which was just published um, a week or so ago, um, about the San Francisco City Clinic experience um, with non-gonococcal urethritis treatment and um, uh, testing for MGen at the first presentation of NGU. So in January of 2020, San Francisco City Clinic implemented DOXY as first-line therapy for NGU. Mind you, this was in advance of the CDC recommendations. Um, and they also recommended to test for MGen at the first presentation of NGU. They subsequently used their clinical data in a pre-post analysis format to look at the primary outcome of persistent NGU um, clinic visits during the time period pre and post with secondary outcomes to look at the proportion that were diagnosed with mycoplasma genitalium. And so I wanna skip over to the data now. Um, and we're looking at this table. In the two years prior to implementation of this, um, about 8% of all their clinic visits were for persistent NGU, which they defined as a repeat visit in under 30 days with continued symptoms. And after they implemented the testing at first presentation and doxycycline, um, that reduced to 3%, which was a 60% reduction in persistent NGU, and which was statistically significant. Their secondary outcomes looked at kind of the distribution of pathogens. Um, and as you know, they didn't see MGen in the pre-period because they weren't testing for it, but in the post-period, about 18% of their um, NGU. Um, could be attributed to mycoplasma genitalium. And um, there were changes in the proportion that were um, chlamydia and, and gonorrhea as well. This also notably decreased um, uh, NGU cases with no pathogen identified, which can be very disconcerting for patients from 82% to 69%. Um, and while this is really exciting data to see, I think there are a few caveats that we need to think about in evaluating um, the study. Um, there were two interventions simultaneously, the doxycycline and the testing for MGen. Um, and it's kind of hard to tease out if it was one or the other or the combination of the two that made the difference um, in the persistent NGU. 
I think the other thing that we need to be mindful of is that this study started in January of 2020, which we all know is a very short period of time right before COVID-19 hit. Um, and it is possible that in the two years following that, um, that people with persistent NGU didn't come back in those um, that kind of under 30 day period because they were trying to lengthen out or, or diminish the not number of times they went to clinic visits. So very exciting. I'd like to see this data repeated um, elsewhere, but something we need to keep in mind. So what are our current treatment, um, treatment guidelines from the um, CDC STI treatment guidelines? Um, I'm looking first at the green boxes on the right. And so there is a recommendation based on the availability of resistance testing. But as I said, we don't have available um, resistance testing in the United States at this time. So I'm just gonna put a big old red, we can't do that. But how does this look clinically? Now, if you move over to looking at the flow diagram, you have a patient who comes in with their first presentation of urethritis or cervicitis. They get treated with doxycycline 100 milligrams twice daily for seven days. Now, hopefully they are cured and they go on their way. You would test them for gonorrhea and chlamydia at the first instance. And if for some reason they had gonorrhea, you'd bring them back for their ceftriaxone. However, if they come back with recurrent or persistent urethritis or cervicitis, at that point, you would test them for MGen. Now, if they're positive, you move on to the box in the bottom, which is the recommended regimen when resistance testing is not available, which is the reality that we are living in. In that case, you would give them doxycycline 100 milligrams twice daily for seven days, followed by moxifloxacin 400 once daily for seven days. Now, one of the big questions we get asked very frequently is, well, they just took doxycycline. How long between their last dose of doxycycline um, and this regimen should I restart the doxy versus just move to moxifloxacin? And I will say we don't have any good data on this, but based on expert opinion, um, in consultation with some of the MGen experts around the world, um, we and kind of looking at the pharmacokinetics, um, we have suggested that you should restart the doxycycline if it has been more than seven days from the last dose. Um, and the doxycycline, even though it is only 30 to 45% effective on its own, somehow, and we don't understand all of this, plays a role in decreasing the bacterial load such that moxifloxacin has a better efficacy. Um, and we saw that as well with the, um, if you have macrolide susceptible um, organisms, giving doxy first followed by an extended duration of azithromycin. So there is something about the doxycycline decreasing the bacterial load that is helpful in, in achieving cure. Now, the really scary part um, of our talk is what happens if you think someone has failed moxifloxacin, right? So, you know, they came in for urethritis, you gave them doxy, they came back with persistent urethritis, they get test positive for MGen, and then you give the doxy-moxy regimen and they come back again. Um, and when I was medical director in the Seattle King County STD clinic, this was kind of my worst nightmare um, because there's not a lot of options available. Here are six options, um, but I'm going to explain why they're not really all good options. The first one here is pristinamycin. Um, it has a fairly good efficacy and I have treated one patient with this drug, but unfortunately it's not available in the United States. The second drug here is minocycline, which interestingly is a cousin of doxycycline um, and has fairly good efficacy in a, as a 14 day course. Spectinomycin, again, it's a single case report. It's not available in the US. It's also IM and for a seven day course, you'd have to bring someone in seven days in a row. The doxy plus a levo, the doxy plus moxy um, are not going to really be helpful with fluoroquinolone resistant cases. And the doxy plus citofloxacin 
There, some have argued that cetafloxacin, even though it's a fluoroquinolone, retains efficacy against some of the fluoroquinolone resistance mutations, but cetafloxacin is not available in the U.S. So when we look at this picture, we've got three drugs not available in the U.S., and two that are really only effective in the absence of quinolone resistance. Our only backup here is minocycline, and that is what it's available in the U.S., um, which you know, doesn't have the highest efficacy um, in a limited number of patients, as you can see there. What is coming down the pipeline? Um, there are a number of drugs in development or recently approved for other indications that may be helpful, um, but none of them have completed a clinical trial specifically for M. genitalium. Solithromycin was being um, developed for gonorrhea, treatment. Um, it completed a phase three trial, and unfortunately, partly for safety concerns and also for um, lack of efficacy um, non -inferior, for not meeting non-inferiority in the phase three clinical trial, um, it was not approved um, and is likely not moving forward um, at all. Zoliflodicin is um, currently finishing a phase three trial for gonorrhea. Um, in in vitro studies, it does look like um, that MGen looks good, has good MICs, and may be effective. But again, it hasn't been studied for uh, for MGen. And I will say that um, right now, it's on an FDA fast track to only be used for gonorrhea. Gepotidocin is another antibiotic that is in phase three trial for gonorrhea, um, but does look like it has in vitro efficacy against um, MGen. Lefamulin is an interesting one, um, and I want to talk a little bit more about this one. It was the last antibiotic approved by the FDA in 2019 for community acquired bacterial pneumonia. Um, it has good in vitro data, um, that it has very low minimal inhibitory concentrations and, and could have efficacy. Um, and there's a phase two trial that is ongoing um, at this moment, which I'll tell you about more in the next slide. Levana de Fluoxacin, sorry about my pronunciation there, um, is a fluoroquinolone that is undergoing trial for skin and soft tissue infections, um, looks to have good efficacy for you know, non-fluoroquinolone resistant um, strains. And then omidacycline is another drug that was approved in 2018 for community acquired pneumonia and skin and soft tissue infections, but we really have no data on it. I know of one provider who has tried using it in a very difficult case of persistent um, mycoplasma genitalium urethritis, um, which it didn't work in that case, but there was some interesting circumstances to that. So lefamulin, there's a phase two clinical trial and in full disclosure, I was a co-PI of this until I moved to the CDC. Um, but Lisa Manhart is um, enrolling patients in a phase two trial for those who have persistent symptoms um, and documented treatment failure or contraindications to moxifloxacin. There is a remote enrollment um, where the provider is a provider to provider consultation um, and then uh, a Zoom enrollment um, with the study physician and the patient. Patients are randomized to either lefamulin 600 milligrams twice daily for seven days alone or pre treatment with doxycycline um, for seven days, followed by lefamulin um, 600 milligrams twice daily for seven days. Um, there's a lot of hope around uh, this since there's not a lot of other options out there for these potentially moxifloxacin resistant cases. Unfortunately, the company that manufactures and distributes Zenleta has recently announced in the past week since I started putting these slides together that they are closing shop. So we are very hopeful that someone will buy um, Zenleta or Lefamulin. Um, and allow this drug to still be on market, um, but um, this study might might need to close soon, depending on what's going on, and, and I don't know where that is right now. 
I wanted to alert you to one other thing from the CDC about MGen is we recently um, put up a new mycoplasma genitalium um, web page with information both for patients and for healthcare providers. Um, and the um, the web address is there, cdc.gov slash STD slash MGen. And that big yellow arrow is directing you to the treatment page, which um, has information about treatment and care, but also about a new M genitalium treatment failure registry. <clears throat> we are really hoping that providers in the community who come across M gen treatment failures will fill out this form. We don't have any, there's no national surveillance or even local surveillance for M genitalium at this time. And so we really want to try to get a handle through this convenient surveillance project to understand how frequently this is happening. And if we're receiving, if we're getting cures with off-label treatments that you know, infectious disease providers or others are providing to their patients, that we could get some data to offer alternative treatment regimens. So this is a, a red cap um, that you, you click on that hyperlink there and it will take you to a red cap um, survey. You don't put any in any PHI or anything, um, um, but uh, it does ask for the provider's name and, and we may follow up with you to get a little bit more information, but you won't submit any PHI on this one. Um, and I believe uh, we're at the summary, which um, I want you to remember that MGen is a highly prevalent infection, both among asymptomatic and symptomatic sexual health clinic patients. It's a major cause of NGU um, based on a number of epidemiologic studies and likely a major player in the female reproductive tract diseases, but we still need uh, more data, particularly natural history of asymptomatic infections and PID outcomes. There is a lot of resistance to antibiotics, um, particularly azithromycin, and there's very few antibiotic options beyond, beyond doxycycline and moxifloxacin. Um, for moxifloxacin treatment failures, um, I didn't explicitly say this earlier, but I think I, if you know what the azithromycin or macrolide resistance is in your area, um, and I'd say if it's you know less than 50% or maybe less than 60%, um, you could consider doing doxy followed by the extended duration azithromycin um, first with one gram on day one, followed by 500 milligrams every day for three days, um, given that we have very few other options. Uh, you know, 50-50 chance um, is better than a zero chance. Um, minocycline would be another option, um, 14 to 28 days. And then, um, as I said, the Lafamulin clinical trial, um, if it is currently ongoing. Lastly, I really encourage you to please report any suspected treatment failures to the registry. It would really help us with data to know um, what we need to be doing um, from the public health perspective. And that is all I have. I really appreciate your time and I need to acknowledge my colleagues who have helped me with different parts of this um, presentation. Thank you so much and I'd be happy to take some questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Barbie. That was an excellent, super informative talk and the chat was extremely active. There are a lot of questions for you. So <laughs> I'm gonna get started. Um, and people have additional time. So go ahead and continue to type in your questions um, for the next few minutes if you have a few extra. Um, okay, I'm just gonna go in order. The first question is going back to your point about the BV and MGen sort of synergy and like why that might be the case. And the question is whether you think that the increase in MGen in patients with BV could be due to local tissue inflammation secondary to BV, or if you have other thoughts as to what is the pathophysiology driving this relationship? Yeah, I think that's a really great question in an area that we need more research in, but I think it probably has to do with kind of changes in pH and in the environment and changes in the other bacteria that are there. Um, I think there's a lot we need to learn in this area of bacterial interactions as communities, right? Um, and so I, I don't know if it's so much inflammation as it is you know, I'm sure inflammation plays a part in it, but but pH and 
and other factors. Mm, sort of like the microbiome of, of right, the... exactly. <laughs> Interesting. Thank you. Okay. Next question is, I think, related to that slide where you were showing how long MGen infection may persist at some of these extragenital sites, mm -hmm. like the rectum or the pharynx. Yeah. Um, my assumption when you were presenting that was that this would be in the case of untreated MGen infection. But the specific question from one of our attendees is, does that mean this sort of like long infection period? Does that mean that even if effectively treated MGen um, is present in the throat and rectum, like can the patient continue to spread the infection for many weeks? And related question, what education do you give patients about how long to abstain from sex after treatment? Okay, um, a couple of questions buried in there. So yeah. Yeah. Just, just to clarify, <laughs> in that cohort, those people were untreated. Um, so they did not receive effective treatment. Um, because there was no, there there still are no clinical guidelines for testing at the throat or the rectum for mycoplasma genitalium. Um, so I would presume, but we also need a lot more data on transmission that they are they can transmit to their sex partners when they remain untreated at the throat and the rectum. Um, I think that answers the first part of the question. Yeah, I think that does. Essentially, it was, were these patients treated or untreated? And it sounds like my assumption that this was untreated patients was, was correct. Yes, yes, these were untreated patients. Um, as for what we tell patients in terms of how long they should abstain after um, treatment, it's complicated because they're on two weeks of therapy usually, right? If you have a known MGen infection, then they're they should be getting a week of doxy and a week of moxy. Honestly, I would probably tell them to wait until about a week after finishing the moxifloxacin, which I know is a very long period of time, but this is a very slow growing organism. And we know that compared to some of our other um, bacteria like chlamydia and gonorrhea, where you can see the kind of decline on your NATS over time after treatment, that you can still have positivity that is, you know, is further out. Um, whether or not that's infectious, it's probably not after a week, but you can still see positivities out to, to three weeks. Um, so, but I would feel comfortable after a week that, that they're not infectious anymore. Okay, so that's week of doxy, week of moxie, wait another week, then you can have sex. It's a long time. A long time. <laughs> okay. that the and they have to be asymptomatic, right? So if they if there's any chance of persistent symptoms. Yeah, fair enough. That makes sense. <laughs> the next question is a little bit more logistical in nature. So, you know, let me know if this is one that we should defer and get back to the requester later. But asking about nucleic amplification testing and whether those tests are covered under most health, in health insurances um, and whether this is the typical test a provider would order to rule out MGen, which sounds like, yes, this is the right test. Um, but as to insurance, that piece, I have mostly worked in like the free STI yeah. clinic setting, so I can't speak so much to private insurances and whether they cover NAT testing for MGen specifically. So I think one that's going to vary by insurance company and state. Um, usually insurance companies go off of the USPSTF. Um, I have to say, I don't think the USPSTF has guidance on mycoplasma genitalium at the moment. Um, in fact, I think I recommended that they do that, but I don't think they've done it yet. Um, sometimes if that isn't absent, then they go off of the STD treatment guidelines. Um, so it should be covered in the case for diagnostic purposes for persistent recurrent, but I can't, I, I think I would look that up, you know, for your state and your insurance company. Makes sense. Got yeah. it. Thank you. Okay. There are a number of questions about partner management in patients who have persistent or recurrent NGU, whether or not you know that it's due to MGen. So this first question is, Thoughts about partner treatment in a patient who who has persistent or recurrent urethritis or cervicitis? Like, do you test the partner first? Would you ever empirically treat the partner? How do you approach this situation? 
Yes, you may have noticed that I conspicuously did not put that in. <laughs> this is not a very straightforward area, right? Again, we know MGen is out there. We know it can cause okay. syndromes, but we don't know the full extent, right? We don't know transmission 100%. So we know that heterosexual transmission is about 50% and that 30 about 30% of partners among men with sex with men are infected. So what has been recommended is that partners with whom they are going to have ongoing sexual relationships, so you know, steady partners, um, should get tested and if they are positive, then treated. Um, and that's because of this antimicrobial stewardship and the combination of the transmission concerns. Hope that makes sense. Um, I think it gets a little bit more complicated. If you want this to be complicated, I can, particularly from, for men who have sex with men. So if the index patient has urethritis, um, you have to consider where with the with the ongoing partner where the partner may be infected, if that's a throat or rectum. And then you have to consider the laboratory issues where if your lab has been validated for pharyngeal or rectal testing, because right now the FDA approval for the aptima is really only for urine or vaginal swabs. So it gets really complicated. Um, I do advise against empiric treatment because we know that transmission is not 100%. Um, and the use of these antibiotics is not benign. Regardless, you know, I didn't get into all of this, but regardless of the antimicrobial stewardship and resistance, moxifloxacin, you know, does carry a black box warning. Um, so we do have to be cognizant of that. Fair enough. So complicated issue, but definitely seems like at least if the partners like to, to have been exposed at a place that we can cite that we can test, it would make more sense to test the partner first before offering empiric treatment for MGen for the partner. Would you agree with me? I agree with that. Yes. Okay, thanks. Another question about recurrent or persistent urethritis or cervicitis. So this time, let's say a patient represents and they have recurrent or pers persistent urethritis or cervicitis after they've already gotten doxycycline. Should we wait for a positive MGen test before treating with Moxie, or should we start Moxie while awaiting test results? And they, they, it doesn't, they didn't provide a number of days that the patient has been off of their doxycycline. So take that into consideration as well. Yes. Um... That is a hard one by the guidelines um, and as the um, clinical team lead now at CDC, I would say you should probably test first. And that's really also guided by antimicrobial stewardship. Um, if you don't have access to testing, which is also um, a possibility, um, it's not unreasonable to consider treatment, but if I were the patient, I would wanna preserve antibiotic use to a known pathogen if you can can get at that. So your thought would be to, to ideally just test the patient and confirm the diagnosis before going ahead and treating for MGen empirically. That would, Thanks. Be, that would be my preference, yes. Okay, next question. I'm sorry, we still have 20 questions in the chat, but we have another 15 minutes, right? Are you okay to continue? Awesome. Thanks nice. so much, Dr. Barbie. Again, this talk was, was very active in the chat, so that's always a good sign that the topic is interesting and there's a lot of unknowns still out there. Yeah. So the next question is also about doxycycline and its activity with moxifloxacin. And the question is, would the doxycycline not decrease the bacterial load if given at the same time as moxy? Like basically, why not give these two antibiotics together? because that would increase the chance of adherence rather than stretching it out over two weeks? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think we just don't have as much data on that. Um, and the, the true MGen experts in the field, like Kat Bradshaw, really believe that you need to have it up front um, beforehand rather than doing it in combination. I think that there have been some case reports on the, you know, doing it together, but it's just not the large body of evidence we have with some, you know, RCTs on doing the sequential therapy. Got it. So just something we don't know a lot about right now and some experts would 
knowing what they know, recommend against that approach. Okay. Okay. I, I had the same question, so I'm glad somebody asked it. First, it says, thank you for answering these questions, Kelly. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but the actual question is, do you have any idea when the MGen resistance testing might be available in the US and, and I'll just add like more broadly available than at the University of Alabama than it is right now. <laughs> um, so no, I mean, Hologic, I, I failed to mention that one diagnostic test slide. Hologic is working on a macrolide resistance assay, um, which is what I think Will Geisler at UAB is using, um, but it is investigational at this point and not um, for clinical purposes, but hopefully, you know, I don't know, they haven't submitted yet to FDA as far as I'm aware, um, hopefully soon. Hopefully soon. Being, being one to two years, I don't know. I think, uh, you know, a, a sort of related question is you, were mentioned, you mentioned this resistance plus testing that's not FDA approved, but seems like it is approved in many other countries. So I sort of had the question myself about, What's the holdup? Is the FDA still thinking about it? Is there some data that suggests it's actually not that good? Or just curious if you have comments on that. Um, yeah, so that's really interesting. The FDA is, um, you know, the the regulations are fairly strict that the data has to be generated in the U.S. And so, to my knowledge, I don't know of any studies ongoing with the resistance plus for mycoplasma genitalium and macrolide in the U.S. Um, I was working with Speedex. They have a, a similar assay for gonorrhea for ciprofloxacin resistance to kind of do resistance guided therapy with um, gonorrhea. And so that trial is ongoing in the U.S., but I don't know of anyone doing the one for MGEM. There's, there's opportunity for all of, all of you. Any research <laughs> in the audience? Okay, but it sounds like the issue is we just don't have enough U.S. data and that that's what we would need for the FDA. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, next question. Bit of a unique experience, but apparently this, this, this person's practice setting has been sent, and I don't know if this is an STI clinic or a primary care or what the setting is, but this, this particular provider has been sending MGen nucleic amplification testing for the past year in persistent cervicitis, vaginitis, and a few urethritis patients. Oh, here we go, in a fairly busy STI clinic. Sorry, I didn't get to that point. Um, haven't had one positive test. Is this common? Where is it being sent and which test is being done would be my question. Um, Fair enough. I, I think... don't have that information, but, but if right. you're person who put that question in, if you want to add that, those details, we'd be happy to address this, this further. But I feel that that would be sort of surprising to not see any MGEN given the prevalences that you had reported. Yes, I, I think that's surprising. And I would question the test um, and the laboratory doing the test. Yeah. Yeah, makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you believe the patient failed moxifloxacin treatment, I'm assuming they got doxydemoxy and then there's concern that they might have failed, let's say persistent symptoms, how long would you wait to retest or would you proceed with some sort of treatment failure regimen right away? I would retest after about three weeks. 21 um, days from the- right. from there's, there's still a large proportion of urethritis or cervicitis that is idiopathic or unknown or some pathogen that we haven't de determined what it is yet. So, and you can certainly have co-infection with some idiopathic and MGen. Um, so you do want to confirm that they truly have failed, you know, MGen, right? And that that's still persistent before moving on to confirm, saying you have an M moxifloxacin resistant MGen infection. And as I said, the nucleic acids clear a lot slower than in other infections. And so I certainly wouldn't look at anything before three weeks. Yeah, makes sense. And, and I'll just say, there were a lot of questions about the, when do you get test of cure if you're using one of these non-standard regimens? And I think the answer, at least from the CDC guidelines, is like 21 days is pretty pretty much the standard recommendation. But I just wanted to say it verbally out loud, because again, there, there were several questions about that in the chat. Yeah. Okay, next one, a little bit more clinical practice style and tips and tricks, but so, so this person says they're prescribing the doxy followed by moxy for MGen, and they're having trouble with patient compliance, probably because you're looking at, you know, two full weeks of therapy. Um, do you have any advice for 
encouraging or promoting compliance for these more these more lengthy treatment regimens it's hard <laughs> it's very hard and anything that you do with you know any of you who've worked with patients who have to take daily meds for a long time and you and you work with adherence in terms of um you know, set a reminder on your phone, use a pillbox, um, all of those adherence um, tips and tricks, I think. And then, you know, really counseling your patient, like un unfinished courses are only going to set you up for the risk of having a persistent infection that may develop resistance. And we don't have a lot of drugs out there for this. You know, you really have to, they have to understand the severity. Yeah, makes sense. So it just kind of gets back to working with your patient, figuring out what their barriers are, trying to use some of those tips and tricks, alarms, pill boxes, pairing it with something that they do every day, like brushing their teeth in the morning and night or, or whatever works. I agree with those and don't have too much more in the way of a particular requester. It's a tough situation. Thank you, mm -hmm. Dr. Barbie. Um, Next question is also kind of about communication with patients. Um, can you address partner treatment, which we kind of already have, but then also how to address concerns about being re-exposed from an asymptomatic partner? So I guess um, in this situation, like a patient has MGen, their partner doesn't have any symptoms. Maybe the answer is you bring in the partner and you test the partner, and if the partner has MGen, you treat them, and if the partner doesn't have MGen, you don't treat the partner. Do you agree with that approach? No, I think that approach is fine. My um, what I'm understanding by the question is that they're concerned that if the patient, the original patient's symptoms, you know, go away, but they still have asymptomatic carriage, is it is what it sounds like to me that they're worried. Oh, they're, okay. they're worried about. Um, um, they're worried about that. So um, I don't have specific tips or tricks on that one, but I do think, um, you know, reassurance that if the symptoms are gone, the most likely <laughs> that they're not going to be um, infectious anymore. Fair enough. That makes sense. Um, and just for the audience, we have about a little less than 10 minutes left. So I'm going to ask that you stop putting additional questions into the chat at this point, just because I want to make sure that we have time to address the remaining questions. We've stayed around 19 more questions at this point. So, so um, we appreciate all the questions. We want to be able to get to them all. Please don't put any more into the chat at this point, just so we can answer the ones that we have. Um, okay. Next question is, what are the brands of test kits that you did you say are recommended as FDA approved? Um, and maybe if, if you want to say them briefly, that's fine. But I'll just I'll just also say we will be sending out the slides uh, after the webinar. So you will have a reference for all of this material as well. So Hologics, Aptima, and the Roche Cobas. It's a that one's a dual platform with Trichomonas and MGen. Great. Are there any plans of making MGen a reportable disease? Ooh, that is a really loaded question, I will say, because um, you know the CDC doesn't actually do that. Um, that is for CTSE, which is the, I always get the first letter wrong, but it's, it's states and territories epidemiologists who actually make that recommendation. And it requires that all states, um, all state epidemiologists agree to do that. And it, it's a very lengthy process. It requires a, a universal definition. It requires that testing is available and widespread. I don't see that happening in the short term, but maybe, maybe in 10 years, we'll see that. Related question just for me. Do you, do you see this sort of registry of treatment failures that you, that you're, that you talked about during your talk? Is that like a first step towards increasing some national awareness of what's going on with MGen? It's certainly a first step to understanding how prevalent treatment failures are. At least that's what we're hoping to do. But of course, it's a convenient sample of people who know about it and go the next step and actually input the data. Um, but yes, yeah, so, so surveillance can happen a lot of different ways, nationally reportable diseases like we talked about, um, and like what Lisa Manhart is doing with the My Genius study, which is kind of a you know, sentinel surveillance in different clinics. 
<clears throat> kind of a, a way of getting at it. Got it. Makes sense. Thank you. That is a tough question about whether we should or shouldn't be reporting these. Lots of discussion around that. Next question. Are there, is there any particular guidance for asymptomatic patients with a known exposure to an MGen positive partner? I think this is sort of that same question we've been asked. And if I if I understand your answer, it's sort of like the partner should be tested. Transmission is not 100%. So partner needs treatment if they are tested and MGen positive. Partner does not need treatment if they are tested and MGen negative. Correct? Correct. Um, I will just give the caveat that... Uh, no, yes, we'll just keep it at testing and treatment, yes. Okay, sounds <laughs> Yes, there are multiple partner questions about partners. We've sort of answered those, so I'm going to skip through some of those. Okay, this is an interesting one. I work in a local health department STD clinic. Our state hygienic lab has started testing for MGen. And they're using the test that has uh, the trick and MGen test combined that you talked about. Until they can separate those two tests, should we be limiting our testing to recurrent urethritis or cervicitis only? I feel like we're treating a lot of positive MGen patients. I mean, I guess the guidelines right now would say that that you should only be testing for MGen at all in patients who are presenting with recurrent or persistent urethritis, although there's some controversy there that you discussed. Is that correct? Yeah, that is um, that is complicated if your only way of getting trick testing is on the dual platform. So my presumption here is that you are using this plat platform, it sounds like, because you want to do trick testing and you're getting an MGen result. I think if you have an MGen result in someone who is symptomatic, you need to treat it, right? If you you, you have that result. Um, but that is definitely one of the complications of these dual platform um, testing test kits. Makes sense. Okay. Can MGen be transmitted by using sex tools? I don't know the answer to this. Curious what you think. Neither do I. I'm sure it probably could be, um, but I don't have any data on that. <laughs> Got it. Okay, this is an interesting question, and I think also sort of an area of controversy, which you addressed a bit, but my patient who's MSM, bottoms, um, has proctitis, has elected to defer any empiric treatment, has been tested, and is negative for chlamydia and gonorrhea, assuming from the rectum. This person is reaching out to their lab to see whether rectal MGen testing is possible. Um, if not, is there any reasonable consideration for empiric MGen treatment? So basically, like in proctitis, if a person is chlamydia and gonorrhea negative, would you consider rectal MG testing and or empiric treatment if you couldn't get testing? This is a little complicated because I would say, have you ruled out herpes as well? Um, I'm assuming that you know we've ruled, if you've ruled out everything, um, it's not unreasonable to to consider MGN as a cause of proctitis. Makes sense. Would you then? Let's say you can't get the testing. You've ruled out herpes. You've ruled out syphilis. Like, would you consider empiric MGN treatment? I think if you can't get the testing, you might have to. But I think I would appropriately counsel my patient about, you know. This is an unknown, and this is a, you know, a lot of antibiotics. Yeah, makes sense. Okay, let's see. Sorry, I'm having to screen through questions at this okay. point. I want to make sure we only have one minute left, so I want to make sure that we get to it. Okay, last question. If a patient with NGU takes doxycycline for one week and symptoms persist, do you start moxie right away to avoid having to repeat the doxy or is it better to wait three weeks so you can repeat the NAT prior to starting another round of antibiotics? Um, well, if they're persistent symptoms and they've completed seven, seven full days of doxy, um, I wouldn't make them wait for three weeks for the test because presumably you haven't done the MGen test yet. So go ahead and do your MGen test. Um, and then hopefully you get the test results back in under a week and you can start your MOXIE right away. That would, that's the ideal scenario. 
Makes it sense. depends on how long it takes the lab. Makes total sense. Thank you so much. That's very, very helpful. We've answered almost all the questions between us in the chat. I really, really appreciate Dr. Barbie, your being here and giving this session and to the audience for all of these great and wonderful questions. And we hope to see you at our next event. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. It's been a pleasure. And um, if anyone had questions that weren't answered, I gave my email on that last slide. Feel free to email me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, everyone.